The confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court is jeopardized when a decades-old allegation of sexual assault surfaces. Should this be investigated? Chief Counsel at the Judicial Crisis Network, Kerry Severino, is here with a response. And the Holy See and China have reportedly reached a deal on the appointment of bishops. Why is the Vatican giving the communist government influence over Chinese Catholics and the church? The Wall Street Journal's Bill McGurn will tell us. Finally, amidst an ongoing abuse crisis, Pope Francis makes significant changes to the way the Synod of Bishops operates. What does this mean to the upcoming Synod on Youth? The USCCB responds to the sex abuse crisis and more. Papal Posse member Father Gerald Murray will react. The World Over begins right now. Welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Kerry Severino, William McGurn, and Father Jerry Murray are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send us a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court nomination is imperiled after decades-old assault allegations surfaced earlier this week. Joining me now with her analysis of the Kavanaugh allegation drama and the status of his confirmation, I'm joined by Chief Counsel for the Judicial Crisis Network, Kerry Severino. Kerry, thank you hey, for being here. Pleasure to, be to see you. Uh, I want to start with this notion that you have an accuser come forward. She doesn't remember a time. She doesn't remember the date. But she claims Brett Kavanaugh forced himself upon her or tried to. Um, th we've had this whole back and forth of whether she should testify or not. They gave her a day on Monday. Doesn't look like she's coming forward. Should the FBI investigate? That's her that's her predicate for appearing before the committee. Well, here's here's the problem. We had her lawyer came out on Monday at several TV shows and said she's ready to testify. We want to testify. All right. Senator Grassley, head of the Judiciary Committee, said, great, let's make this possible. They schedule a hearing. He has bent over backwards to try to make it a circumstance that she will be comfortable with. Does she want to have cameras there or not? Does she want to do it in person, on the phone? He's even said, I'll send people wherever in the world. Even you in are, private. If, in, in private, yeah, I'll send them mm -hmm. to you in California. Do you want to have, I mean, some, some people say it, ha it should be on TV. So she, I'm, he, they're willing to do whatever it takes. If it's closed, confidential, that would be fine, too. They want an opportunity for her to share her story, and, and Judge Kavanaugh wants an opportunity to, to refute these allegations. Unfortunately, we saw after that happened, you know, the very next day, suddenly uh, the goalposts were moved. And it was, well, we, and on second thought, we don't want a hearing unless we get an FBI investigation first. Here's the problem. The FBI has done its background investigation. They do two things. They do these background investigations. They're collecting information. They don't make a judgment call. They don't say, this person seems on the up and up. We don't believe this person. Right. They hand over the information to the White House and to the senators. They're the ones who constitutionally are making the judgment of this, mm -hmm. this person going to be nominated and confirmed. They also investigate federal crimes. There's obviously no federal crime at issue here. Right. So the FBI... And 36 years later, right. it's hard to, to, to track any of this down. But, yeah. it, it, but then it begs the other question. Shouldn't the Senate be inviting the witnesses to this thing or the purported alleged witnesses to this event and Kavanaugh into the hearing room? Here, here's Monday. the interesting thing. They have been. You haven't, the Democrats have been out there for four days in front of the televisions saying, we need a hearing investigation. Meanwhile, the Senate Republicans have actually been doing one. They have, they have in, interviewed Judge Kavanaugh under penalty of felony um, about this. They've invited Dr. Ford to, to do this, this preliminary investigation. She didn't come. The Senate Democrats were invited to participate so they could question the witnesses. Mm -hmm. They have declined to cooperate whatsoever. They've actually received statements from, from two of the men who, have been, who were alleged to be there. Right. Un, under penalty of fel felony, again, they've reached out to, to another one who hasn't responded yet. They've reached, they reached out to the woman who on social media said that she had information about that. Um, she, she refused to comment. So they, they've been doing everything they can on all sides to try to, to amass that evidence. So there is an investigation being going, going on right now. But there right is now. precedent for an FBI investigation. We saw it in the Anita Hill case where the FBI FBI did investigate. Now, that was a leaked, that was a right. leaked tip to the FBI that it looks like they had already put aside. 
and then it was resurrected because it was leaked. Yeah, I think the timeline's important here because this is how it happened with the Anita Hill investigation. Yeah. It went to, to Senator Biden, who was chairman of the committee. He didn't do what Senator Feinstein did, didn't sit in it for six weeks and try to time mm -hmm. it politically for him. He actually did the right thing, turned it over immediately to the White House, who said to the FBI, go and you know take take these depositions effectively, mm -hmm. do these interviews, and they did it They did it confidentially, so it would have, it respected Anita Hill's privacy, it respected Justice Thomas's reputation, and any, any other witnesses they spoke to, all confidentially. After that came back, and the White House judged that, okay, this is actually not really founded, not credible, that's when it leaked, and once it became public, they didn't do further investigation. Mm -hmm. We're right, we're at that point, where it's just leaked, it's become public, we're do, they're doing exactly the same thing that, that they did back in 1991, which is, okay, now we're going to move and, and have this hearing so that the Sen senators, because they're ultimately the ones, not the FBI. The FBI doesn't say red light, green light, we believe them, we don't. It's the senators who make that call. So they're the ones now doing this investigation, mm -hmm. same as we did in 1991. Uh, Senator Feinstein, who is a ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, had had this letter from Dr. Ford, the woman alleging abuse, since July. And she said she didn't make it public because she wasn't asked not to. She had this to say earlier this week when asked about Dr. Ford and the validity of that letter. Listen. This is a woman, and I really believe, who's been profoundly impacted mm -hmm. by this. Now, I can't say everything's truthful. I don't know. Your reaction, and what do you make of the curious timing of the drop here? Well, look, the experiences Dr. Ford describes are horrible. I, but the evidence that's building up suggests that it wasn't Brett Kavanaugh who is involved. And it's been 30-some years, memories are fuzzy, I don't, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but she, she may well be sincere. However, when we look at someone who his, his history, everything we know about him, all the women at the time, even women who dated him at the time, are saying this isn't the kind of person he was. He categorically denies it. Unfortunately, what we see is the Senate Democrats are treating this not responsibly like they think, they think it's a, a, a credible or a, or a serious allegation. They're treating it like a political football. Mm -hmm. It's ironic that the one person who's treated it with the seriousness that it, that it merits is Senator Grassley. You know, instead of, he didn't sit in it for six weeks. Within 24 hours, he had already scheduled a hearing, had reached out to try to, to speak to her and get more information, to ask her what other evidence she wants to, to try to help get. Mm. That's, it, it's, uh, the Senate Democrats, I think, are the ones who are treating this uh, in, improperly and using her as a political pawn. We've seen a lot of character witnesses come forward. For Brett Kavanaugh, 65 mm -hmm. women who knew him in high school came forward. They said, this is not the man we know. We stand by him. Um, similarly, the other night, CNN featured a classmate of the accuser, Christine Ford. This is Samantha Gary with Jim Acosta. Watch. Was this the first time you had heard anything like that with respect to Judge Kavanaugh? Absolutely. It was not the first time I've heard anything like that in terms of the community of women that I know and uh, not regarding him, but those sorts of things went on. A lot, you know, one of the things that's been surprising to me as I've gotten um, involved in this in the last couple of days is how many women of my class have come forward to me in this the last few days and said, I had similar experiences in high school, and this hits me very deeply. And I, it's very Not with Brett Kavanaugh, but with other boys. Not with Brett boys. Kavanaugh, but with other boys in our community. And, um, and, and we all feel that if we were in her shoes, we'd want to be taken seriously as well. Your reaction? I, I absolutely agree. I have, I have friends who have had a similar experience, and I, they absolutely should be, should be taken seriously. That, that type of behavior should never be allowed. However, that doesn't make the fact that there's, there's a, a, a real problem with, with these kind of assaults happening does not make Judge Kavanaugh guilty of one. Yeah. We need to make, I, I'm a mother of daughters and sons. I think we need to make sure we show deep respect for both men and women in these situations. And so it's important to have a very fair process going forward. That's what we're trying to, to hopefully will come out of Monday's hearing. Look, I think all these accusers should be heard. I don't care who you are. You should be heard, present evidence, but the burden of proof has to be on the accuser, not the accused or the FBI or in the investigators. Mm -hmm. They're not there to prove your accusation. You have to give some evidence of that or corroborating witnesses. Um, they've decided, the Judiciary Committee, they will vote on Wednesday, come hell or high water, whether she shows up Monday or not, a good idea? 
Well, I think the problem is, as, as we were discussing before, the timing of this really suggests the Senate Democrats, again, they're not treating this as a real investigation. They're not even really treating her as that seriously. They're treating her as a political pawn. They want to delay. Their goal here was to, to, to get, get Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation blocked mm -hmm. altogether. And if they couldn't do that, at least delay it. They think it, that plays well politically for them. Because you believe the Democrats knew back in July of this well, and they it, didn't Senator bring Feinstein it up did, in the hearing. Senator Feinstein did, and the rest of them even knew for, for at least a week before it came out. They did nothing to attempt to, to investigate or validate those claims at that time. I think we need to make sure that they, this isn't encouraged as a, a technique for how can we use these things political. We don't, we don't, we need to take sexual assault seriously and not use it as a political weapon. Very quickly, you at the Judicial Crisis Network are spending $1.5 million on a television campaign to support Kavanaugh's candidacy here, yeah. nomination. Is that a sign that you believe his nomination is in jeopardy? You know, we've, we've been running ads talking about Judge Kavanaugh since he was nominated. I mean, this is something that is simply, in today's media-driven age, one of the ways of communicating with people because we've learned that a nominee, him or herself, isn't really able to make those pitches. They get their opportunity before the Judiciary Committee hearing, but that's this one point in a right. many months process. Our group's mission is to be out there to defend judges like Judge Kavanaugh who, uh, who are, are faithful to the Constitution and the laws and often are being attacked. Will Brett Kavanaugh be the next Supreme Court Justice I, of the I think United he will. States? Okay, Carrie Sabrino, thank you Good for being you. here. You can follow Carrie's work at the Judicial Crisis Network at judicialnetwork.com. Bill McGurn is up next on this China Vatican Pact. But first, a little news to share with you. The United States said they are ready to continue their denuclearization talks with North Korea, and the negotiations will be completed by January of 2021. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made the announcement on Wednesday after another round of successful peace talks between the leaders of North and South Korea concluded this week. After those talks, South Korean President Moon Jae-in vouched for the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, saying that he has again and again affirmed his commitment to denuclearization. Moon is facing pressure from Washington to find a path forward in an effort to get Kim to completely and unilaterally abandon his nuclear arsenal. However, Kim has stated that he would only dismantle North Korea's main nuclear facility if the United States acts in kind. Joining me now is former speechwriter for George W. Bush and columnist at the Wall Street Journal, Bill McGurn. Bill, thanks for being here. Ah, you're welcome. Uh, I need to get into this. Last week, it was reported that the Holy See and China are scheduled to sign an agreement in Beijing concerning the nomination of bishops sometime at the end of September and before October. According to reports, the Vatican has agreed to recognize seven Chinese priests who have been excommunicated by Rome for acting as bishops without Vatican approval. The Vatican is prepared to accept them as bishops. Meanwhile, two actual loyal bishops who have remained faithful to Rome all along will retire to make room for prelates more acceptable to President Xi. In exchange, China promises to officially recognize the Pope as head of the Catholic Church in China. Bill, what does the Vatican hope to get out of a deal like this? I don't know. I, the only argument they can make, China is in the middle of a crackdown on Christian, on all religions, frankly, right. the Muslims and so forth, um, on all of them. And uh, the only argument for this is that it's going to get bad. This is the best deal we could cut in bad circumstances to try to preserve something. But, you know, they shut out anyone that knows anything about China. I lived in Hong Kong, as mm -hmm. you know, for yes. almost 10 years. And uh, Cardinal Zen there is, is a person who's dealt with the Chinese, worked yes. with the seminary in Shanghai, and they completely froze him out. It's amazing. As part of the scheme, and we're going to get to Cardinal Zen in a moment, uh, Bill, the last time I spoke with him, I'll share some of his insights. I want your reaction now, knowing what we know. Uh, as part of this scheme, a Communist Party panel would choose the bishops, and then the Pope would have veto power. Here is Cardinal Zen of Hong Kong, who is adamantly opposed to this deal. When we spoke last March, I asked him how the selection of bishops might work under the deal. Here's what he said. They say, oh, the, the authority of the pope is safe because the last word still belongs to the pope. But <laughs> the, the, the problem is, what can be the last word? Uh -huh. huh? uh, uh, how the pope can approve people chosen by the government, but now they choose with any consideration of uh, the likings of the Holy See. 
Because mm. in this moment, there is no agreement, but there is compromise. And they still pay attention to what, uh, you know, uh, are the choices of the Holy See. But mm. when you give them the power in their hands, they use it fully. And so mm. they make uh, their, their own choice. And the Pope can only veto. But right. I ask how many times he can veto? How many times? He may be embarrassed to, to, to veto uh, for 10 times. They say, uh, we, we uh, consider the, the reasons for this veto. Uh, if we find it unreasonable, we, we go on our way. Bill, how do you see this plan working in reality? Well, you know, the uh, Wall Street Journal had an editorial said, imagine if Donald Trump demanded the right to choose the candidates who would become bishops mm. in the Catholic Church in America, would say this is ridiculous, right? Mm. Uh, and uh, is it any more sensible to give this to an atheistic communist regime? Remember that in China, mm. they want control. They have, it's not the Patriotic Association, you know, the yeah. official state-run church. Right. It's the Bureau of Religious Affairs, which is atheistic, and they want to control religion. It, it's just, it makes no sense. Also, China has no incentive to fill a seat. Say the Pope vetoes someone 10 times. What does China care? It goes un, unfilled. They don't like religion anyway. So it, it's just a terrible, mm. it's a terrible surrender. It's been a hard fought battle over the centuries for the church to get the right to name bishops, its own right. bishops and its own integrity. And uh, to give it away uh, for this, I think, is really, really foolish. Uh, defenders of this action, Bill, say, now, wait a minute, there's predicate here. It's happened in Vietnam. It happened back in the French, with the French crown, where they were allowed to pick bishops and submit them to Rome. Um, wh what do you say to that? I think, look, we've been trying to move away from that. It makes no sense to do this. There's no reason to do it. Why would you do it now? You're going to split the church as uh, you're going to recognize a schismatic church, the Patriotic Association, leave these other people out on the lurch. Look, it's true that the distinction between the so-called underground church and the Patriotic Church is not the quite the bright red line that some people think in America. Mm -hmm. It's been really eroded. Many of the people, the bishops in the Patriotic Association, have been secretly reconciled with Rome. So it's a right. much, it's a much more gray area. But you don't give them the recognition. It's just, and look, it tells you something that this is all done by the Italians at the Vatican, right? Mm. They specifically excluded anyone like Cardinal Zen That's who has right. dealt with the Chinese communist and knows how to. Imagine, imagine if people um, kind of concluded this kind of deal when John Paul was in Poland. I mean, it's, it just beggars belief. Right. No, it really does. And, and what do you make of the fact that now we know Cardinal Theodore McCarrick was one of the, the emissaries right. for the Pope on this. I mean, does that taint this deal and the, and the way it was crafted? I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Cardinal McCarrick. You know, I had my own run-in on China with him. Mm. When I was in the White House, I proposed a meeting between President Bush and Cardinal Zen, and a lot of people fought that meeting, and apparently one of them who fought it in a very sneaky way was Cardinal McCarrick. Mm. But I don't think we can blame This is the Pope's deal. It's the Pope's people. Mm -hmm. um, he pursued this deal. Uh, I mean, the only thing we hope is that the Chinese get too greedy and, and don't go for it. Because I think what the Pope's after is a restoration of diplomatic relations and a papal trip. Yeah. But it, it's going to come at a terrible price. You know, Raymond, let me give you a story. When I first yeah. went to China in the 80s, I went to Mass at, I think it's St. Ignatius in Shanghai, Old Church. Mm -hmm. And I believe they were still doing the Latin Mass because, you know, they didn't, they didn't recognize Vatican II yeah. until much later, right? So I'm watching this, and ahead of me, two pews ahead of me, was this very old lady, and she's wearing sandals, and you could see tire treads on the back because they were taken from old tire, tires. Mm. And I was feeling sorry for her, thinking this poor old woman... Um, what she's been through for her faith. Then I thought, don't feel sorry for this woman. She won. She's still here. Mm -hmm. She's still faithful. This deal is such an affront to people like that. Yeah. Bill, earlier this month, the AP reported that uh, Chinese authorities are burning Bibles and crosses. It's illegal to post prayers or catechesis online. They're forcing Christians to renounce their faith. We know several churches have been destroyed this year in China, including a mega church in the last month. Given all of this, can the Chinese government be trusted to keep any deal they make with the Vatican? 
No, the Chinese can't be trusted to take anything. They, um, they don't keep their word. They have a record of not keeping their word. Look, it's not just Catholics, as, as you point out. It's mm -hmm. other Christian groups. And it's, it's Muslims and Buddhists. Um, well, there's a million Muslims worry about in, the in, Dalai in an internment Lama. camp. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a total crackdown. They want control. The irony is they like to present uh, Catholicism and Christianity as a Western import. But Christianity has actually been in China in different forms since the 7th or 8th century, right? It's communism that is the biggest Western import um, China's have. So these people that are, you know, cracking down on this as illegitimate, um, they have to take a look at Chinese history themselves. Mm -hmm. Could it be that the Vatican is seeing um, what we're talking about here and they're trying to make this deal? I mean, if you talk to people in the Vatican, as I have, they'll tell you they want to make a deal now before the situation gets worse, that they're not even looking to restore the diplomatic relations that were broken in 1951. Do you think that's credible? No, I don't. And uh, there's no reason for a deal now. There just isn't. You know, one of the history... One of the facts of history of the Catholic Church in China is making deals with dynasties and so forth right before they, they fall, they you know, as the Jesuits tried to do. So I think we should let um, someday communism is going to fall, and I don't think this deal is going to look that good. I mean, the church mm. has made these kind of agreements before. I hate to make the comparison with Hitler and so mm. forth. Um, I don't think it's going to hold up well, and I think it's going to really demoralize a lot of people. You know, we don't even know what the full deal is. And my understanding is that even after they sign it, we're not going to know all the terms. Right. And They're I would like to, to know, for example, I'd like to know, for example, does it include the release of all Catholics and especially bishops and priests who have been incarcerated by this regime? I mean, this is the moment to get them out. Right. I, I just think it's, it, it, it's um, undercut some of the most faithful Catholics in the world who have under gone tremendously brutal treatment. In February, the Chinese government implemented a set of new regulations to control religion in China, and they included five transformations of the Catholic Patriotic Association. That's the official church in China. Right. Here they are, localizing religion, standardizing management or control over the appointment of bishops, indigenize theology, meaning to co contextualize it I in terms of communist China, and show financial transparency and adapt Christian teaching as to mold them into institutions that reflect the objectives of the Communist Party. Now, Bill, what impact will ideals like that have and realities like that have on the six million underground Catholics, which are about half the number yeah. of Catholics well, in, in China? Well, let's first talk about the reality of China as, as a woman uh, that I knew who's, who's quite elderly now, but has been one of the links between the Vatican and the church in China over the years, told me, whatever you say about China and the church is true of some part of China. It really varies. In some places, there is really militant persecution. And in other places, the mayor's wife might be Catholic, and they, they, they let a lot go. China is very hypocritical. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of stuff on paper doesn't get turned in. But again, the Patriotic Association doesn't mean anything. They're trying to bring the Catholic Church under con the control of the Bureau of Religious Affairs uh, run by an atheist for an atheist government. And they, they, they want control. They don't want yeah. anything that they can't control. Yeah, and as people And if you tell give you. them control over the bishops, the personnel, given the importance of the bishops mm -hmm. in any Catholic structure, um, you know, you're creating a lot of lackeys. Uh, I, in my interview with Cardinal Zen, I asked him about these new government regulations and if the Vatican might be playing into the hands of the Chinese government. He said this. It's obvious, he says, because now they are giving the whole administration of the church into the hands of the so-called Patriotic Association, but which is just a puppet in the hands of the government. And so it's a complete surrender. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, he said what I was just saying when he said right. in the hands of the government, he means the Bureau of Religious Affairs. Mm -hmm. That's the real player here. The Patriotic Association doesn't really mean that much. They want control. Yeah. And that's what they're after. And unfortunately, I think that's what the... Um, the Pope is giving him. It's, it's, it's just a terrible, terrible precedent. Bill, there are 101 bishops in China, 65 in the Patriotic Association, 36 underground. Those are bishops who have been loyal to Rome at great cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, it appears under this deal, they'll be forced 
into the Patriotic Association, into the arms right. and under the thumb of the government. How does this affect the long-suffering loyal Catholics out there? I, I think it's terrible. Look, um, if you're, again, the underground isn't quite what people think here. It's not always mm -hmm. like the catacombs and dark. They, they, they might be just unofficially uh, recognized. But those people have put up with so much. And in the past, they would say, at least the Pope is on my side. Mm. And now they have nowhere to go. The government is going to insist that they all come under the government-controlled church, and they have no place to turn. It's going to be very, very demoralizing. Look, it was always going to be a challenge at some point to reconcile the people in the underground church and the people in the above-ground church, right? It's, mm -hmm. It was always going to be a problem. Part of it is generational. But this just poisons the well. This is going to make uh, for for very bad things. And again, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to know if any Catholics in prison in China are going to be released on this. If the Vatican made this deal without that, I just, I just think it's unconscionable. Yeah, well, it would be, it would be maddening to do that. So at least right. free your own people if you're going to trade right. away all your this power. This is the moment, right, this is the moment you have the leverage, you know, when right. you're making the deal. They're not going to get more accommodating after. Hmm. In, in your great piece on this, which I, I put up on social media and I'll repost, uh, the Vatican's China syndrome in the Wall Street Journal, you write that the Vatican may be joining an unfortunate list of Westerners who have claimed to have gotten a good deal with China, only to come to find out <laughs> they had been had. What do you think will await them? I mean, how do you see this playing out? I think it strengthens China's hand. It discredits Rome in the eyes of many Catholics, demoralizes them. I think it's going to be a mess and, and no clarity. And I don't see the church being strengthened by it in any shape or form. Also, I think the Vatican, this is one of the problems, and it's the problem with a lot of Western deals with China. Mm -hmm. The Vatican wanted a deal much more than China does, right? Oh. What does China really care about mm -hmm. this? And so I think it was eager to trade whatever it had to trade um, to do this. And they want control. Communist regimes are not about Marxism. Mm. China, China sort of abandoned Marxism as an economic theory a while ago. They're not about Marxism. They're about Leninism, about control. Mm. And they don't like independent institutions that can challenge them. Finally, I need to talk about Brett Kavanaugh for a moment. Uh, I know okay. you knew him and his family. You know them. Right. What do you make of some of the pieces we've been seeing, even in the Catholic media? America Magazine had a piece talking about the toxic masculinity of, uh, of, of the, the school he went to, which was a Jesuit institution, and that he somehow embodies that. Your reaction? Right. Look, my reaction is, I don't know what went on in that room in Maryland. I don't even know if Brett Kavanaugh was there. He denies that he was there. There's no evidence for it yet. And it's amazing to me how this man is being smeared. I mean, when he appears Monday, I think he has to look at the Democratic senators and say, Senator, what do I need to do to clear my name so my children don't ask me, Daddy, did you try to rape someone? Mm -hmm. What can he do? That he should mm -hmm. put the challenge on them. This is his Clarence Thomas moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the America Magazine piece you mentioned was written by the president of Fordham Prep, mm -hmm. um, and, and it was very, I think it was very dishonest in the way it carefully avoided saying Brett Kavanaugh was guilty, but sort of slyly implied it all the time, mm -hmm. including in a headline, Brett Kavanaugh and Toxic Masculinity. I would like the president of Fordham Prep to write a story about toxic masculinity and one of its most prominent alums, Cardinal McCarrick. It's, mm. just, it's just so dishonest and very unchristian, I think, the way this man and his family have been treated. Bill McGurn, we'll leave it there. Thank you for being with us. Bill's column, Thank you. Main Street, appears each week in the Wall Street Journal at WSJ.com. It is always a worthy read. And joining me now with analysis of the Pope's new apostolic constitution and how it will affect the upcoming synod is canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York, and esteemed member of the papal posse, Father Gerald Murray. Father, thank you for being here. Thank you, Raymond. Now, we will get to this open letter, uh, your open letter to Cardinal McCarrick in a bit. But first, uh, I want to ask you about this new papal document. It's on the Synod of Bishops. It's called Episcopal Communion. And it gives new powers to the Synod. As originally conceived and operated, a Synod was largely a consultative body. But Francis has changed that. It appears that uh, uh, under this new document, it gives whatever the synod decides, their final document, magisterial authority. 
How is that different from before, and why is it significant? Well, the previous conception of the Synod was that it was basically an advisory body to the Pope. It was not part of the Pope's Roman Curia. It was, it's an, an institution established to bring together some representative bishops from the world and give him advice. The advice would be in the form of a final document, and then the Pope would issue his own document and would take points from mm -hmm. the Synod's final document. Now the rule is that if the Pope likes the final document, he's going to make it his own, meaning he's mm. going to say the content of this is all what I intend, so it will become part of his ordinary teaching magisterium. That's a big difference because now the Synod Fathers are going to conceive that what we're writing here basically has to conform to what the Pope expects because the, the Pope would probably like to approve everything we write. Uh, I don't like that idea because if you already know that this document could become the Pope's rather than your own, you might conform more to his thinking and not really give honest, straight opinions of what you think is important. Uh, in, in this document, the Pope calls for greater dialogue and collaboration between the bishops and the papacy, and he grants more powers to the general secretary of the synod. Now, given the chicanery we saw with the insertion of items into the final document of those uh, family synods and forcing topics upon the bishops that they did not want discussed, does this worry you, the power being given to the general secretary? Uh, I am concerned because this document consists of 27 articles, uh, 27 rules. The previous document that it is abrogating, meaning it's making the former document uh, no longer valid, that had 41 paragraphs. There are a lot of paragraphs mm. missing, including uh, rules about voting, so how will, in the past you had to have two-thirds majority on any proposition or document mm. to reflect the synod's uh, unanimity. Now it speaks about we want consensus of the fathers as far as possible. Well, you know, if, if, if they're looking for consensus, that means everyone agreeing to it, uh, we have to know, well, will they get to vote on each proposition? What will the nature of it be? Because remember, the Pope overruled the previous right. rules. In the previous Senate, when some of the doc, some of the points didn't get two-thirds majority, and Pope said, doesn't matter, put all those points in the final report. Mm. Uh, there's nothing also about uh, reporting to the media and even to the fathers of the Senate what's going on. There are no rules about that. The document refers to particular law, meaning another document that will have to be issued in order to regulate all these activities. Because the old rules no longer apply. And right. so the new Senate's coming up in l less than two weeks. Mm. Uh, this new set of rules better come out quick. And uh, I'm you know, worried that we might see some more manipulation, as Cardinal Pell said, right. at that Senate, uh, the first extraordinary Senate. Well, and, and uh, Edward Penton's book, uh, summarizing it, was called Rigged Synod, as you'll recall. Um, yes. How do you think these changes might affect that Synod on the youth coming up? And do these synods now become miniature Vatican councils, changing, developing, altering doctrine, or practice at least, that leads to the alteration of doctrine? Well, I'm concerned when the nature of the synod becomes not so much a group of bishops uh, getting together, discussing an issue, and then voting on what they think is important, to, in the new schema, find, trying to find out what is the pope expecting and how can we arrive at a consensus so that he can approve this document and make it part of his magisterium? I think the old system was better where the Fatinid Fathers said what they wanted, took the vote, and then the Pope wrote his own document and he could incorporate what he thought was important. Mm. So, yeah, I am concerned because stage management uh, at these big events, you know, this is 300 people. Yeah. Uh, if there are no clear rules uh, and, you know, a kind of expectation of independence rather than this consensus mode, uh, we could have problems. Well, I have a problem in that it, it seems patently unfair because you lay out rules and say, we're going to make this much more diplomatic. It's almost like a parliament that he's convening. Yet at the same time, he, the Pope, reserves the right to overrule all rules and become emperor when he so decides. For instance, uh, the bishops of each conference chose bishops that they would send to this synod on the youth. The American bishops had their own list. Then. In the 11th hour, the Pope appoints Cardinal Tobin, Cardinal Supic, Archbishop Paglia, uh, uh, Father Spadaro, and others, kind of progressive-minded prelates, to be his special envoys to the, to the Synod. Uh, it, it, you know, so on the one hand, he's saying we have to be attentive to the people of God. And on the other hand, um, 
you see him kind of, you know, everybody's kind of monkeying around with the process here. Well, the Pope does have a right to appoint people to the Synod as he sees fit, and mm -hmm. I'm going to say that that's a good principle. Now, on the question of Cardinal Supic's nomination, the background that is of interest is that he was a candidate for, uh, you know, the American delegation to go over, and he was not voted in. Uh, Bishop Barron was voted in, mm -hmm. uh, the auxiliary from Los Angeles, and so... Uh, for the Pope to say, well, you didn't vote him in, but I'm picking him, looks like he's telling the American bishops you made a mistake. Mm. Uh, the Pope's entitled to do that, but, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who would be worthy uh, participants in that synod, and, um, you know, I wish the Pope had uh, broadened the scale or the scope of his choices to include mm. some other outstanding people who are not going to be present. Mm. The USCCB announced the Bishops' Conference in America new abuse prevention measures this week after their recent emergency meeting in, uh, in the Vatican and then in Washington. And they've approved a third-party reporting system for abuse and sexual harassment. They promised to develop new proposals for policies addressing restrictions on bishops who were removed or resigned due to abuse or harassment. They promised to develop a code of conduct for bishops and they support a full investigation of Archbishop McCarrick. Um, here's my question. What most people may have missed here is that Cardinal DiNardo and the bishops went to Rome to get approval for a canonical and independent lay investigation of McCarrick. And it appears they didn't get what they wanted, Father. What do you make of these steps and of that... Um, uh, refusal from the Vatican to grant a lay commission. Well, I'll say this. I don't know that it's a refusal because the Vatican might still has not formally responded to the meeting uh, mm -hmm. that they had with Cardinal DiNardo. I approve and, and support the American bishops and what they're doing because they are trying to take action now to basically get a handle on this scandal of uh, bishops having uh, abused their authority in the case of Archbishop McCarrick actually yeah. being a, a sexual abuser himself. So yeah. uh, I think more is going to come from Rome. The, the essential point, though, is the reporting mechanism is just that. It's a reporting mechanism. If you call this hotline or this mechanism, this uh, institution they're going to establish, all they can do is relay that concern to the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So the Vatican has to come up with a way to make you know swift justice. I, personally, why is it that we haven't heard from the Vatican that Cardinal McCarrick's trial has been scheduled? Right. Uh, you know, how many months does it take uh, to find, uh, you know, put things in order? So uh, there, are, there are steps being taken, but I think we need more, and we need them more, uh, more quickly. Yeah. Uh, after the Vigano allegations were made, uh, those explosive allegations that Cardinal Whirl, uh, officials in the Vatican knew of McCarrick's misdeeds and the misdeeds of others, uh, it seems there's a narrative uh, evolving, and um, one of them this week concerns the head of the Congregation for Bishops, Cardinal Mark Willette. He had this to say in an interview with Zenit on September 15th, and he suggests that the Pope and the bishops are under attack and that people are angry. And he said this, this is a very serious matter that has to be dealt with in a very serious way, not only in a political way, so I think, for example, when there's a direct attack against the Holy Father, I think it is a very bad example and a very serious offense, and I do not think it is responding positively because it is also an unjust attack recently, referring to Vigano. Again, we, we have another high-ranking prelate seemingly ascribing partisan motives to the revelations of Archbishop McCarrick's crimes, misdeeds, and a cover-up. Your thoughts? Well, you have to be very careful when you attack a whistleblower, and that's precisely what Archbishop Vigano is. Uh, he has stated that the Vatican knew about what was happening in uh, the McCarra case. They knew he had abused seminarians and priests. They had put him on restrictions. He ignored those restrictions. Uh, Vigano said he told Pope Francis about the restrictions. Yet uh, Archbishop, uh, or then Cardinal McCarra, kept uh, serving in this high-profile role as a representative of the church. Only after the attack, uh, the, uh, not the attack, but the revelation that he had sexually molested an altar boy came forward, then McCarra was removed uh, and, and placed on basically restrictions awaiting trial. So I would say that Cardinal Willette um, is misinterpreting the nature of what Archbishop Vigano did. He is not attacking the Pope. He is saying to the Pope, 
there is a responsibility for the McCarrick situation, which goes all the way up to the top. And according to his knowledge, he says the Pope has been negligent in handling the McCarrick case. I think it's up to the Pope, and many people agree, the American bishops in particular, the Pope should say, let's investigate the whole thing. Let's answer these questions. That's what's needed here. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, if there's a problem, uh, we want to solve the problem. We don't want to make the whistleblower into somebody who has to be disrespected because, mm -hmm. believe me, Vigano didn't do this to advance his career for publicity. He did this because he has a heartfelt anguish about the fact mm -hmm. that everyone say, how did McCarrick get ahead in the church? And Vigano says, look, they knew about McCarrick and they still left him in place. You know, Father, when you bring up these allegations, and look, I think any whistleblower, whether it's the, the Kavanaugh accuser or Archbishop Vigano, hear out the allegations. If they seem credible or are credible, you have to investigate them. Now, if, particularly when you have dates, times, names, places, as Archbishop Vigano does. We found a book this week by uh, Paul Dinter. It's called The Other Side of the Altar, and in it, on page 72, moving on to 73, he writes, One now prominent churchman as a young bishop would invite groups of student priests to his country place. When they arrived, he would assign each a guest bed, but would inevitably run one short. The last guy, the bishop's pick of the pack, would be told, Well, I guess you get to, get to sleep with your bishop, to the nervous laughter of the group. He says, A few years after learning this report secondhand from one of the chosen ones, I also heard a rumor that the same bishop had been summoned to the Apostolic Nuncio in Washington, D.C., and given a dressing down. If, in fact, he received such an admonition, it didn't adversely affect his career. He has been steadily promoted, first to archbishop, and then to what has become a regular red hat see in the United States, and as such is one of the Catholic cardinals now sanctimoniously crowing about the church's need to protect its children. That is, of course, Archbishop McCarrick. And it seems to substantiate some of what Vigano suggests. This book was written, by the way, in 2003. Oh, it does. I, I remember reading that book many years ago. Paul Dinter is an ex-priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He was mm -hmm. chaplain at Columbia University, Catholic chaplain there. He left the priesthood. Uh, the book uh, does state that, and in fact, uh, I remember hearing the same rumors years ago, that it was his beach house as Archbishop of Newark, and he'd bring people there. So, you know, this word was out. Uh, he mentions going that McCarrick was called to the nunciature. Right, Vigano, that's the big again, part. again, is uh, confirmed. So um, the question here really gets down to why did the Vatican protect an influential churchman that they knew was an immoral man and could continue his immorality if he were left in place? That's the central question. Uh, Bishop, Archbishop Sandry's, now Cardinal Sandry's, letter in 2006 to Boniface Ramsey, in which mm -hmm. he refers to Ramsey's 2000 letter, in which he complained about McCarrick. All of these corroborating uh, documents coming forward, this only calls for a further uh, and complete investigation. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Holy See should throw the files open and say, look, uh, we're not going to protect anybody who did wrong in protecting McCarrick because that's just the cycle of abuse that we claim we're trying to get rid of in the church. Hmm. Uh, I want to draw your attention to something, get your reaction. At his masses at the Casa Santa Marta this week, Pope Francis accused some who were drawing attention to scandals of being hypocrites. He said on Thursday, they, like hypocrites, are the devil's instruments for destroying the church. He went on to say, and kind of in their voice, but look, what a scandal. You can't live like that. Now everyone has a right to enter the church, even divorced people, everyone. But where are we? What do you hear there, Father? <clears throat> wow, I hear a few things. One, uh, you know, criticism of the bishops and raising scandal. Well, look, um, that's part of being a shepherd. You know, you want to hear, are part of the flock been ravaged by wolves? And were some of those wolves formerly, you know, shepherds under the chief shepherd? So, yeah, you want to know that stuff you know, head in the sand approach, we'll take care of it, don't bother us with your complaints. That didn't work in Chile. Remember how vehemently mm -hmm. the Pope attacked the, the lay people who were against Bishop Barros? Yeah. Well, guess what? After the Pope investigated, Barros is fired and the Pope apologized. Now, as regards letting divorced people into the church, divorced Catholics are always part of the church. You don't cease to be a member of the church simply because of a problem with your marriage or if you enter into an invalid second marriage. Mm -hmm. 
But you can't receive communion if you're living in a state of adultery. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not a human create. That comes from the words of our Lord himself. Mm -hmm. The man who divorces his wife, marries another, commits adultery. We can't change that. This is why Amoris Laetitiae, which the Pope will defend without actually answering the specific questions that the dubia cardinal placed, uh, this is not a defensible uh, teaching because the, the words of the Lord and the doctrine of the faith have always said the exact opposite. If you mm -hmm. live in an adulterous state, you must refrain from receiving communion. Yeah. With all the controversy swirling around sex abuse and, and uh, people asking for answers, the Pope did take time this week, about 30 minutes, to meet with Bono of U2, the lead singer of the Irish rock band. Uh, Bono had this to say afterward. He said the Pope and he discussed beast capitalism and the abuse crisis. Watch. We talked about uh, his aghast, his, his, his feeling that he had his, excuse me, we talked about the Pope's um, feelings about what has happened in the church. And I, I explained how, you know, it looks to some people like the, the, the abusers are being uh, more protected than the victims. And he, you can see the pain in his face. And um, I felt he was sincere. And um, I think he's an extraordinary man for extraordinary times. Rather tortured there. Uh, the body language was interesting. But Father, given all that is happening now, what do you make of this meeting and the time the Pope took with it? Well, I'll say in his defense that every Pope meets celebrities. It's just part of the job. On the other hand, I would say with all holy, uh, due respect to you, holiness, why is it that a rock singer can get in to see you and Cardinal Burr can't? I mean, that question has is, is been, you know, hanging there for a couple of years now. Uh, Cardinal Burke and the other dubia cardinals are not the enemies of the Catholic faith or the Roman pontiff. They want to serve the interests of the church. They want an opportunity to get an answer about why is it that Amoris Laetitiae is in conformity mm -hmm. with previous doctrine when they say it isn't. So, um, you know, the Pope is something we respect and love, but on the other hand, as in any family, if you don't speak honestly to your parents, you're doing a disservice to them. Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to which, Bono was a major advocate for loosening the abortion laws in, uh, in That's Ireland right. recently. That's which, it's a know, scandalous behavior on Bono's part. Was, did the Pope correct him? You know, it doesn't sound like it. Mm -hmm. uh, many are saying the bulk of this abuse, Father, happened. And you see the way it's being framed as a, uh, a partisan. It's a partisan battle. Partisans wanting to bring the Pope down. And they're saying, look, this has already been addressed. It's in the past. But right now, we are learning stories about a San Diego priest facing trial for abusing a seminarian. We, the Diocese of Brooklyn has announced a record settlement for $27 million in the case of four men who were abused by their religion teacher between 2003 and 2009. Has most of this sexual abuse by clergy been addressed so far, or is this an ongoing plague in your estimation? And I'll add, they just arrested a priest in the Houston Archdiocese oh. for sexual abuse, uh, facing now charges. Um, it, certainly, the record that we know, there was a lot of abuse in the past, and there's less since 2002, and the bishops adopted the essential norms to implement the Dallas Charter. But a full accounting has never been given diocese by diocese for what went on in the last 50 years, and that would be necessary and useful because undoubtedly, and I say this uh, with regret, undoubtedly there are victims who've never been vindicated in public by knowing that the church has owned up to the fact that indeed Bishop X protected priest Y and priest Y did horrible crimes. Mm. Plus it's, you know, how can we say that everything is clear? The Boston, excuse me, the Brooklyn case happened after the year 2000. I think it happened between 2003 and 2007. Right. So. Um, and that case was absolutely horrible. I, I'd like to know what was going on in the Brooklyn Diocese. Did anybody su supervise this man? Uh, nobody commented. What's going mm -hmm. on here? Now, he went to jail, that priest, as far as I know, uh, which is good. But um, saying this is all in the past and you're focusing on history, no. Uh, you learn from the past, and then you also make sure, as uh, the bishops are now doing, that all things will be revealed 
uh, because we cannot live this secrecy and hiding. That, that, that is a horrible thing and needs to be rejected. No, I agree with you, and I think uh, it's a time that demands credible investigations, and I think the only way you're going to get there is by involving the laity with a canonical component and a financial audit should be part of, part of that. I don't know how you get around that. Uh, you're not going to establish credibility. Otherwise, you're going to have these attorney generals rifling through old cases, and that's going to be, that's going to be like a bonfire that overwhelms the contemporaneous crimes going on now and the malefactors hiding now. They need to be uncovered, not only the ancient sins of the past. Uh, I've got to get to your read on this, Father. We only have three minutes left. Letters from Pope Benedict XVI to Cardinal Walter Brandmuller, one of the dubia cardinals you mentioned a moment ago. They were leaked this week. And in it, Pope Benedict addresses his concerns to the cardinal back in 2017 about the issue of his abdication and assuming the role, creating the role, of Pope Emeritus. I want your reaction to this. He wrote, in my case, it would certainly not have been sensible to simply claim a return to being a cardinal. I would then have been constantly exposed to the media as a cardinal is, even more so because people would have seen me in the former pope. With Pope Emeritus, I tried to create a situation in which I am absolutely not accessible to the media and in which it is completely clear that there is only one pope. If you know of a better way and believe that you can judge the one I chose, please tell me. Now, the New York Times preposterously suggested that this is Benedict defending his successor and swatting away Francis's critics. What do you make of this? Well, as you recall, when we did the coverage uh, of the election of Pope Francis and then the news came out that Pope Benedict was not going to be Pope Emeritus, I was not happy mm -hmm. uh, because um, there is no Pope Emeritus. That's never been the case in church history. Uh, you can be Bishop Emeritus of Rome, but since the Bishop of Rome is also a universal pastor, it's not good to have the idea that there's a, a secondary retired bishop hanging around. It would have been much better if he had named himself uh, titular bishop of another diocese, yeah. and he didn't have to go back to the College of Cardinals. He could have simply been retired archbishop of X diocese, and he could have also, as pope, he could have uh, given himself a residence in Vatican City State, which would have meant no access by any media because uh, that area is controlled by the Holy See. Um, I, it, wearing the white robe is a nice thing from the point of view of there's the retired pope, and he's continuing in that way. But I think it creates confusions that we've got the old pope and the new pope. Mm -hmm. I would have been much better and more, I think, you know, striking to the people of God if they saw him back in a black cassock mm -hmm. and simply as the now retired archbishop of a titular see, meaning he's retired, he's not accessible, and um, that would have accomplished the purpose. So, but it's debatable. What I mm -hmm. think, you know, the pope didn't like that idea. Maybe if someone proposed it, that's fine. Yeah. But, um, well, but there were a, other ideas. This is a personal letter between friends. This is not sure. somebody it wasn't smacking it's not a public down proclamation. critics. Uh, it was in 2017. Very quickly, I've only got 30 seconds. Sure. Why did you write the open letter to Archbishop McCarrick? No, I wrote open letter on the Catholic Thing website to Archbishop McCarrick because he's putting the church through agony by keeping his mouth shut. Uh, he resigned from the College of Cardinals after he was accused of abusing an 11-year-old boy. He never answered those charges. Mm. Uh, the church needs to know that a shepherd who turned into a wolf uh, is interested in the salvation of his soul and wants to confess his sins. And the victims need to know mm. that they're not simply court cases waiting to happen. They are real mm. people whose lives were damaged by an evil man. Mm. And if you recognize your evil in the sight of God and the people, forgiveness is possible. I mean, right. I want him to, to go to heaven, but you can't go to heaven if you don't admit your sins. In the case of public offenses, that needs to be done publicly. Father Gerald Murray, thank you as always for being here. And uh, that open letter is at thecatholicthing.org. We'll talk to you next time, Father. Before we go, there's a movie I want to tell you about. It's titled Unbroken Path to Redemption. It's the incredible true story of the late Louis Zamperini, an Olympic athlete turned World War II bombardier who was captured and tortured by the Japanese. He survives through an act of faith, pledging his life to God. We recently caught up with the stars of Unbroken to discuss the film and Zamperini's path to redemption. It's the sequel to the best-selling film and book, Unbroken. Take a look. Bless you, Louis. Welcome home. All of Torrance was praying for your safe return. Miracles didn't save me, Padre. 
a couple of atomic bombs did that. <laughs> People from all over the country want to know if you're going to run in the London Olympics. So what happened to Lou after he got back from the war is he, he didn't have something to physically fight against anymore. He didn't have something to push against. There was no resistance left for him to pour his energy into. It was just like he had for his, basically his entire life. And so when that happened, all of a sudden now his mind became the thing that he had to fight and his experiences in his past. After the war, my dad comes back. Of course, he's, this, he's uh, the great sports figure that was presumed dead, so he's come back to life at the end of the war. And of course, everybody wants to hear his story. And so he began to tell the story, but it was hard for him to do. So he would have to have a shot of some alcohol of some kind to get up enough nerve to, to talk. And so eventually more and more alcohol pretty soon he was self-medicating with the alcohol dealing with the horrendous post-traumatic stress disorder that he had in his life that was manifested in these terrible nightmares he had about the bird beating him and then him choking the life out of the bird you will never escape me wherever you go i will find you Are you sleeping well? You're having any night sweats or nightmares? I just thought I'd be able to forget everything. I want to go home! There is no home. He struggled with PTSD. No one even in that era recognized what that was, and I think it was really difficult, and I think it's so relatable for people that are going to see the movie to see a relationship that's tested, that has its high ups and its mm. low downs, and I think, I think Cynthia turned his life around. I mean, she was really the turning point for him yeah. when they had lost all hope and she found Billy Graham and she was able to find hope and forgiveness mm -hmm. and in turn able to convince him to go and him ultimately to find God. That, that saved their lives. My good man suffered. Why doesn't he stop the pestilence? Why doesn't he stop the wars? You need help. Here tonight, there's a drowning man. Just looking for some type of hope for the future. But there's a lifeline. Just reach out. Unbroken Path to Redemption is out in theaters everywhere. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. I'll keep you up to date on all the news as it breaks. Those links are at RaymondArroyo.com. There's also my new Will Wilder book up there. If you haven't seen it yet, the cover reveal is at the website. Be sure to tune in next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.